And of course, Mark Meadows, Trump's former chief of staff turned co-defendant in the Fulton County election interference case. Meadows is at the heart of the sprawling, high-octane racketeering case brought by Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis, a case that has spooked Mark Meadows so badly that he is using every ounce of his legal firepower to try and get it moved from Fulton County, Georgia, to federal court, arguing that everything he did was part of his official job as Trump's chief of staff. Specifically, he's trying to dust off and invoke a 234-year-old federal statute which allows federal officials charged with state crimes to transfer those charges to federal court if the alleged criminal behavior was carried out as part of that person's official duties. Meadows is arguing he was acting as Trump's chief of staff when he committed the alleged conduct. Now, that sounds like a stretch to you. Well, you are not alone, because today in open court, at least one of the three judges hearing Meadows' appeal, well, they sounded skeptical too. According to him, it seems like everything was within his official duties, electioneering on behalf of a specific political candidate and an alleged effort to unlawfully change the outcome of the election in favor of a particular candidate when the office of the president has no preference for who occupies it. Now, remember, this isn't the first time Meadows has tried this. Back in September, he tried, and he failed to get his case moved to federal court. Now he is at it again, and while we'll give him points for shooting his shot, that's about it. And that is where we start today with Politico national correspondent Betsy Woodruff-Swan, plus former lead investigator for the January 6th Select Committee, Tim Hafey, and here at the table, president of the National Action Network and host of Politics Nation here on MSNBC, Reverend Al Sharpton. Betsy, walk us through Meadows' argument here, why he wants this case to be moved to federal court so badly. Meadows' attorney has been arguing that the federal law essentially requiring that current federal government officials have criminal charges related to their federal duties be adjudicated in federal court also applies to him, even though, of course, he's now a former federal government official. His attorney, George Terwilliger, is a very prominent, very seasoned white-collar criminal defense attorney, used to be the deputy attorney general, second in command at the Justice Department, is very familiar with these types of high-stakes uh, legal fights. Uh, and it's understandable, of course, that they're trying to do everything they can to gain every advantage for Meadows. That said, him having his case removed to federal court would certainly not be whatsoever a get-out-of-jail-free card. It would potentially make the jury pool slightly more helpful for Meadows. It would potentially make the processes and procedures involved slightly uh, less user-friendly for the district attorney's office. But this isn't uh, a magical escape mechanism for Meadows. That said, when you're dealing with potential prison time, you try to do everything you can to uh, capitalize on any advantages that might be available. That's what Meadows is doing here. Tim, Mark Meadows was the proverbial white whale for the 1-6 Select Committee. We never did hear from him. It's partly why Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony became so explosive. Uh, I want to play just a little bit about her testimony of her former boss. I found Mr. Meadows in his office on the couch. He was scrolling through his phone. I remember leaning against the doorway and saying, I had an interesting conversation with Rudy, Mark. Sounds like we're going to go to the Capitol. He didn't look up from his phone and said something to the effect of, there's a lot going on, Cass, but I don't know. Things might get real, real bad on January 6th. And I remember Pat saying to him something to the effect of, the rioters have gotten to the Capitol, Mark. We need to go down and see the president now. And Mark looked up at him and said, he doesn't want to do anything, Pat. I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. Tim, all just part of his official duties? Absolutely not. Not everything that a White House chief of staff does facilitates the official actions of the president. We heard this repeatedly over the course of, of the select committee investigation. Witnesses saying this is covered by an executive privilege because it involves official responsibilities and my advice to the president about 
official responsibilities. The, the special counsel and Bonnie Willis in Georgia are saying this is outside the scope of your official duties, things that bear upon an election, things that are beyond official business, but rather maintaining office are outside of the scope of official business. This was the same argument that the district judge, Judge Jones in Atlanta considered. He ruled on behalf of the government that this is outside the scope of Meadows' official business. Meadows could articulate no limiting principle as to what is and what isn't within the scope and what's outside of the scope of his official business. He basically is arguing, everything I do as White House Chief of Staff is within my official role. That just can't be the law. The judge, the trial judge rejected that argument, and it sounds like the appellate court judges had some problems with that as well. Tim, just to underline a, a differential here, if, if he goes to federal court, there are no cameras allowed in that courtroom where we all know that the case out of Fulton County is likely to be live streamed. I, I wonder the extent to which you think that might be factoring in here. I think it's probably a minor factor. Look, if he is successful and moves this to federal court, then he'll argue not only should it be in federal court, but I have immunity. The president has similarly argued, President Trump himself has argued that he has immunity for actions taken in his official capacity. So this isn't the last legal step that Meadows will take if he's successful. The cameras in the courtroom, you know, hard to say which way that cuts. You know, the, the president wanted cameras, wants cameras in the courtroom in the Jan 6 matter. Uh, it's been the government that's been resisting that. Uh, I think there's a public interest and transparency to these proceedings, given how significant they are and, and how the, whatever happens in court, there's an interest, a public interest in sort of legitimacy. Um, I, I think this is all motivated by Meadows to get into federal court and then potentially to move that he has complete immunity uh, because of his official position. Rev, I want to talk about that, this public interest in, in making sure that there is integrity in this process. There is the evidentiary value of watching Meadows testify. There is also, of course, the symbolic value of watching him testify. And I think we have to weigh both carefully. We must remember if Mark Meadows can now move to federal court because he wants to have a wider uh, geographic area to choose a jury and because of other uh, things that he wants, then what stops anyone else from making that argument? As the judges hear this, they're making uh, law and making decisions that others will use in future cases. And I think that as he makes this bizarre argument that operating in a way that was clearly a uh, design toward upending an election is somehow doing his duties as chief mm -hmm. of staff. I've dealt with three or four presidents. They won't even talk politics in the building of the White House, in the Oval Office, to be conspiring on how you're going to deal with how votes were counted and the strategy of upending an election. Clearly, if they set a precedent that you can call any of those political activities, even if you say they're not criminal, they were clearly partisan political, then you set a precedent that changes that whole policy that in the White House we don't deal with politics at all. And I think that the judges have to weigh all of that as they hear any of these arguments from not only Meadows, but from Trump himself. Betsy, let's talk about those judges, because I'm sure you are sensing the same skepticism from this panel that I am sensing during today's hearings. The judges, they too seem skeptical if Meadows loses this appeal. What options does he then have left? What it, which is another way of saying, is this in fact, like many things that we talk about, Betsy, destined for the Supreme Court? That seems like a like a perfectly reasonable bet to make in this case. And the problem for Meadows is that all three judges on this panel have raised real questions about the argument that his legal team is making. One judge in particular uh, is a really interesting participant in these proceedings. Nancy Abudu was recently confirmed by the Senate to this judgeship. And before uh, entering the judiciary, she was a voting rights lawyer. She worked at the Southern Poverty Law Center, and her portfolio included litigation related 
related to voting restrictions in Florida and in Georgia. So she brings a really unique perspective that's often underrepresented in the judiciary as somebody who's worked on this very specific issue of elections and election process. You know, she raised questions that were challenging for Meadows' lawyer, but perhaps even more concerning is the fact that Bill Pryor, another judge on this panel who was uh, reportedly on Trump's shortlist to be a Supreme Court justice, raised serious concerns as well from a textualist mm -hmm. perspective. That's the conservative legal view that laws need to be read very narrowly in terms of black and white what's on paper. And Pryor's question was, why should we assume that, that a law referring to current federal officials also encompasses former federal officials when the text of the law itself doesn't say that? Uh, that question is one that it's challenging for Meadows teams to answer. And if Pryor's not persuaded, then it's, it's a huge issue for them if they couldn't get him on board with their argument.